I, do I have a, a, a right to edit? <laughs> what is it? Um, we you, don't edit. <laughs> if you're going to give a presentation, um, you do it really four times, three or four times. You, you know, you kind of prepare before, but then when you're delivering, you look at, assess what's going on, so you have to change it. And then, of course, then you deliver it. And then on the way home, you start saying, well, I really should have said this, <laughs> this. And that's usually the best one, yep. the one in your car with, that yes. you're ranting about when we you're home. We don't do that, though. <laughs> <I just laughs> you get one shot. <laughs> Okay, this is an interview at Lions Hall, Kinesis College, Buffalo, New York. It is the 7th of May, 2008, approximately 2.30 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Thomas James Caulfield, Buffalo, New York, 1932. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? A uh, college degree. Bachelor of Science in History. Okay, and where was that? Canisius. Canisius, okay. All right, um, now you, when did you enter the service? October 10, 1955. All right, why did you uh, decide to enter the service at that point? Well, at the time, there was the draft. Mm -hmm. And I got noticed that if I didn't do something real quick, I was going to be drafted into the Army. So, in panic, I ran to the Navy. <laughs> asked if, um, if I had done a little inquiring that they had a, a naval aviators program and uh, the guy said that I probably would qualify or might qualify for it so I, I signed up. Mm -hmm. Was but anyone the, in your family ever in the Navy or was that a... Yeah, my dad. Mm -hmm. My dad served World War I, pharmacist mate, second class and served on the USS Mercy. Okay. Um, where did you go for your, your training? Well, direct from Buffalo to Pensacola, Florida. That was November 27, 1955. Two days after Thanksgiving. All right. Um, that was, was that for naval aviation training? Correct. Okay. Correct. Uh, could you tell us about your training there? <clears throat> well, it was rigorous. Definitely rigorous. Um, I spent two weeks in the, well, supposed to spend two weeks in the indoctrination battalion. I, I had to spend four weeks along with two other guys from Buffalo, Dick Auerbach and Ray Kennedy. We went down together, and we didn't go in immediately as soon as we landed to report. We had to report by midnight. We waited until, like, 11.15, and we reported in then only to find out that too many had reported aboard for that pro for that class. Mm -hmm. So we were held over an extra two weeks in the hellhole, we called it, the indoctrination battalion. That was my beginning lesson with the Navy. Uh, I'm not sure what lesson I learned from that, except uh, be on time, maybe a little early. It will be to your benefit, usually. But anyway, uh, the program there in pre-flight there was four months of pre-flight training for all AOCs. I was an aviation officer candidate, AOC. Did you see um, uh, an officer and a gentleman at the yes. movie? Okay, that was that depicted the training that an AOC went through. Mm -hmm. Mornings uh, would be uh, classroom. Afternoons would be physical training, marching, um, going through a whole series of physically oriented stuff, including uh, boxing, wrestling, uh, uh, the manual of arms for drilling, um, drilling out in the field, uh, competitions. Uh, it was pretty rigorous from then. I could actually do 20 pull-ups by the time I finished that thing. I can't do one now. <laughs> <clears throat> but that went on for four months and then we got our commission as an officer. Uh, there, our classroom the academics consisted of, uh, well, the biggest one was navigation. But there were also classes in engines, a class in aeronautics, um, the theory of flight, aviation. Um, they had classes in naval orientation, naval history. Uh, 
you know, so you pick up some of the tradition of the Navy. So by the time you finish, you know, you get a pretty good sense of what the military was like. I don't think I've ever been in better physical shape than I was when I finished that four months pre-flight. So then we got our commission at that time. That was like in April, I believe. <clears throat> um, then we went from NAS Pensacola to uh, Whiting Field, which is about 35 miles, 40 miles east of Pensacola. It's basic flight training. They put us into uh, the SNJ. They gave us a we had a classroom for about a week and a half, two weeks, to learn the specifics of that aircraft. Now that was the old World War II RECIP engine? Correct, SNJ, right? Okay. The Air Force variety is called the AT-6. AT-6, okay. It was a two-seater. The cockpit looked like a greenhouse, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I think it was like a 1,200 horsepower engine. Um, retractable gear. It, at the beginning of World War II, that was a, a frontline aircraft used by the Navy, but then it became its main training aircraft for many years after the war. Mm -hmm. uh, nice airplane. Fun to fly. Um, then, after Whiting Field, they took us through A, B, C, D stage of training. Uh, at the end of A stage, you uh, you uh, sold. That was like 18 flights in the SNJ. Then you would go from that to B stage. Well, now that you can land and take off safely, now we're going to teach you how to fly level. <laughs> and be a little precise with your flying. So they, that's where we learn how to do Hemmelmans and uh, things like that. C stage was uh, aerobatic stage, where they took us into uh, doing spins, stalls. Well, we had done some stalls before, uh, but spins, uh, Illumins, chandelles, uh, loops. The one I liked best was the uh, uh, half Cuban eight maneuver. It was designed to deliver the atomic bomb by this aircraft. Want me to show that? Yes, what, what was that? I'll do it with my hands. Okay, you start a loop. You start a loop, and you go like this, and then when you get up here, that's where you release the bomb. So it will continue its trajectory up a little bit. It'll have to finally, it'll, uh, gravity will take over, mm -hmm. and then we'll start falling. In the meantime, you're going like this, and you roll out and get the heck out of there. You get as much distance between you and the explosion as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> that was a neat maneuver, half cube and eight. Uh, that was aerobatic stage. Uh, then when we finished that, basically, uh, then we were transferred to another air airfield, which in this case was Softly, which is on the west side of Pensacola, not too far from it. There's a number of outlying fields around the naval base at Pensacola. Uh, softly field. We uh, first learned um, night flying, how to make landings at night. That was a challenge. And you know, you think a guy's going into combat <laughs> as a student pilot. Some of these challenges really got your adrenaline going. Mm -hmm. um, so we learned night flying first there, and then we learned formation flying. Now, were you still in the SNJ at that yes, point? Yes, still in the SNJ. Now, at the same time, a new aircraft was just entering the training command. Matter of fact, half my class was split. All of us AOCs went in the SNJ, the older, more difficult aircraft to fly. All the, the uh, NAVCADs, these are guys with two years of college, who had to go through the full program before they got their commission. Uh, they started off in the T-34. Basically, only takes 10 flights to solo with the T-34, but it's not as complex. The SNJ mm -hmm. was 18 flights. But anyway, so now we're assigned to uh, Softly Field, 
and uh, night fly formation flying. That was that was neat to learn how to, to fly in formation and not get yourself killed because um, you you've only got well when we started out we had a uh, 12 foot step back and 12 feet down wingtip to wingtip. And that was your position. You tucked in there. You're about 45 degree angle with the other cockpit, and you do our formation flying. And you have six airplanes in the formation, and there's strategy how to rendezvous, um, uh, different maneuvers that you can perform with while you're in formation that's reasonable and so forth. Uh, graduation day for, from formation was you went out in two plane formation, and uh, the job of plane number one would be to shake number two. To throw him off so he can't find. The job of number two is to stay with number one, no matter what he mm -hmm. does. And uh, that, that was a challenge. And, uh, I, did, I did okay with that. Uh, after formation flying, then we went into uh, another airfield, which was Barron Field, down there at Pensacola. Barron Field. We uh, started off with um, gunnery, shooting at the air, the sleeve, okay. Um, I think my, my uh, I have a record there, 100% hit. The reason for that was <laughs> I got two bullets off. They both happened to hit the sleeve, and then you come back up, join. The sec my second run, the gun jammed. I couldn't get another shot off. Well, the gun jammed right after it let two bullets out. And for the rest of the flights, uh, the training command was suffering financially at the time. Maintenance wasn't the best it could be. My guns jammed for the next three flights, <laughs> and I never got another bullet off. So I had a 100% hit rate <laughs> with my two. <clears throat> That was gunnery, and then we did bombing, how to, how to make a bomb run, make sure you pull out before you hit the water. Um, had to pull out before 600 feet. You'd release around 1,200 and then pull out by six. Uh, after bombing, um, gee, kind of, uh, then we went into um, carrier qualifications. And we practiced on the airfield about 10 flights, mm -hmm. which was a rather critical way of flying an airplane because you flew the whole pattern just a couple of three knots above stall speed, which is dangerous. There's an old saying, you never want to fly low and slow in an airplane. Uh, flying around there, we were, had our gear and flaps down, and there's maybe 12 planes in the pattern. You come around, and the whole idea was to come as you come into uh, the box that the LSO landing signal officer would, would want to have you placed in. If you're in there, he gives you a cut. You pull the power off, and the plane immediately sinks to land, simulating a carry deck where hopefully you'll catch the wires mm -hmm. and the landing will be successful. So we practiced that about 10 flights, just practicing FCLP eagles, field carrier landing practice. After uh, those, then we finally went out to the carrier. And uh, we flew out in formation. And we were around 3,500 feet when we arrived at the carrier. And it looked, yes, it looked about the size of that envelope. Not that big. You're saying, this is really going to work. But we went through the procedure basically simulated what we had done on the on land. And I got my six qualifying landings. I have a little card that says the the deck of the USS Saipan has absorbed the shock of six landings by Ensign Thomas J. Caulfield. That, I've got that someplace in my records, that little card. <laughs> After carrier quals, then we were assigned to Corey Field for some basic instrument flying, um, instrument training. It got a little more intense. Uh, a lot of it was in the link. 
but then we went up on several flights. And it was at that time where Can they... Can I ask a second, what, what kind of plane were you using all this time? SNJ. Always so that. Whole, right. I, almost, I almost got transferred over into the T-28, which mm -hmm. was another new plane coming into the training command. Uh, I had just a couple of flights in that, but then they changed everything around and we're right back in the SNJ. Okay? At Corey Field, they asked, okay, what do you want to be assigned to? Do you want single engine? Do you want multi engine? Or do you want helicopter? <coughs> That's a fire? Talking about that, you just finished that. Oh, that was such a thrill. Such a thrill. And the SNJ, it was on the USS Saipan, mm -hmm. which was an escort carrier. Did, didn't need a real big one for uh, the SNJ. But uh, to get there and to snag a wire, then be released, and then have the guy signal you to wind up and then go. Hold your brakes and full power. Sounds good. Go. Take off. To see the carrier disappear, disappear, and then it's just straight water. <laughs> was, but you knew you were okay. Uh, coming back around in the pattern for your next landing was quite a quite a thrill. Okay. Oh, so, so then after carrier calls, we went to Corey Field, basic instrument training there. And while we're, we were getting that, they asked, "What branch do you want to go into?" Well, I selected multi-engine. Okay just coming off carriers and I'm figuring, do I really want to get into jets landing on a regular basis on a carrier? That'd be okay. But my cousin had, had uh, ridiculed flying single engine jets, so you're just flying the stovepipe is what you're doing, is the way he put it. And I don't know why that impacted on me so big, but it did. But anyway, I figured um, multi-engine was the way to go, so I did. And then they sent me from, that was the basic training command, to advanced flight training. And I was assigned to multi-engine. Uh, that was in Hutchinson, Kansas. So in Hutchinson, Kansas, I was transitioned into the first multi-engine airplane I ever flew, known as the S2F, which is a carrier-based multi-engine airplane with wings fold and everything, S2F, uh, two engines. Now, who was that made by? Good question. Uh, S2F, oh boy, you got me there. Okay, sorry. Can't help you. <laughs> uh, North America comes into mind, but that North America was the uh, SNJ. I can't help you there. Okay. Uh, so we flew the SNJ, I flew the SNJ to the point of our solo, which is a cross country with two student pilots, going come back safely. Uh, basically, went through many of the same things we went in, through in basic, learning the flight characteristics, the stall, stalling the aircraft, recovering from stalls. We didn't do spins, but in some instrument training with it and uh, emergencies. And finally, when we got to the point where we could fly cross country and back safely, then they transitioned us into a bigger plane. This case was the P-2V, known as the Neptune. Uh, these were two engines on these aircraft. These are the P-2V series twos and threes that they had in the training command. Now these were, were these turbos at that point? No, these are straight R-3350s, made by Lockheed, by the way, okay. yeah. P-2V, but uh, R-33, they were right, R-3350 engines. Um, big guys, 18 cylinders, mm -hmm. absolute ground school before we got into the airplane again for another week, week and a half, two weeks, uh, then starting off learning how to fly it, training sessions, to the point where our uh, graduation from that was two student pilots took that cross country and back safely, and we, that we, we completed our multi-engine. Um, then from that, at Hutchinson, we went into advanced navigation, which included celestial navigation. And what they were training us for was how to fly out over the ocean or anywhere in the world 
using the sextant, <clears throat> an aviation type sextant, which was great at averaging your observations. Um, a lot of celestial training, knowing the stars, and um, kind of a romance to that, but very demanding. Uh, so that's when I got married, while I was in the navigation stage of advanced flight training. We got married in August, and I finished my advanced flight training in October. October of 1957, I was assigned to my first operational Navy base, which was VP-23 in Brunswick, Maine. The main mission of VP-23 was anti-submarine warfare. That is the uh, searching, locating, and destruction of enemy submarines. That was our mission. At the time, this was Cold War, um, you know, between us and Russia. The Russians had over 500 submarines. They'd acquired a whole bunch of them from the Germans at the completion of World War II. A lot of diesels that they used. And the diesels are very quiet submarines, you might know. Uh, the, nu the nuclear submarines really hadn't come in mm -hmm. to the picture yet uh, in 1957. But by 1958, yes, nukes were out there operational. Matter of fact, 1958 is when the Nautilus made its first run under the ice cap, under the North Pole. Um, and to this day, I'm convinced I caught the Nautilus, but I'll, that's another story. Maybe I can get to it later. But anyway, I was assigned to VP-23, Brunswick, Maine. My wife and I went there. Um, this is like two months, three months after we were married, and she was experiencing morning sickness by this time. So our first baby was on the way. Um, anyway. Got to VP-23, Brunswick, Maine. I was there in that squadron for two years and rose to the position of becoming a patrol plane commander where I would go out on anti-submarine missions, day or night, all weather, um, fly patrols for 10, 12, 14 hours, uh, very lengthy patrols with a 12-man crew. And by this time, once I got to VP-23, the airplane that they were flying was the P-2V Series 7, which was no longer a two-engine aircraft. It was now four engines. Same model aircraft. They simply took two jets and put them out, outboard of the reciprocating engines. So we were an AC-DC aircraft. I don't know. We were both reciprocating and jets. Uh, what the reason was, um, electronics, electronics were becoming so sophisticated by this time. The mission that we flew was so complex, and they kept putting more and more black boxes on this airplane so that it was unable to take off with just the two engines. We had to have the, the two jets outboard to, so we could safely get a flying speed. <laughs> get air for him. So we'd crank the jets up um, just before takeoff, use it for takeoff and climb to altitude. Then once we were established on altitude at our, our desired cruise speed, then we shut down the jets to save fuel. It flew on the same fuel as the R3350 engines. Um, and if we lost an engine that was a backup, we could c crank up a jet on that side. So it was a very safe aircraft. Didn't lose too many because of engine loss. Mm -hmm. We tended to lose P2Vs when we were uh, flying tactically. Um, the, but by that I mean uh, some of, of most, we would fly our patrols around about 2,000 feet, which is a nice safe al altitude. But when you're like 600 miles out over the Atlantic Ocean, flying at night, and you, uh, you uh, locate a submarine, so you're processing that, that uh, find. It required that we get down to the water. While daytime, we'd be 200 feet off the water. 
the wingspan of the aircraft is 100 feet. So it's 50 feet, 103 feet. You're down another 50 feet on the low wing flying your circle. Um, so it's only 150 feet up off the water. And if you dip the wing a little bit too much, you're going to catch a wing tip in the water and you, it's, it's all over. We were prosecuting submarines at that altitude. Um, uh, at night, they allowed us to run our patterns at 500 feet. A little safer. Mm -hmm. But still, when it's black out there, and dark, no stars, no moon, you're under the overcast, you don't know of dark until you're <laughs> flown in those conditions. <laughs> and you just pray that your altitude and your altimeters in agreement, and uh, that you're at a safe altitude. Um, where do you want me to go from here? Well, um, I guess you were in that unit how long? Okay, I was a VP-23 for two years. Uh, in the Navy, an officer always has a collateral duty. Air Force, if you're a pilot, that's your job. Mm -hmm. Navy, no. We're a tighter budget, always have done. Uh, you have another job, so I would be a pilot uh, on a crew, and my collateral duty when I first came in, I was aviation equipment officer, which took considerable time to uh, make sure that things were safe, mm -hmm. and that things were done properly. And then later I became a uh, survival officer in that squadron, which is a little easier job, actually. But, what um, did that encounter? Okay, aviation equipment officer. I was in charge of all the aviation equipment on the aircraft. That included oxygen equipment, um, oxygen masks, leather flight jackets, flight suits, flight boots, and our Mark IV anti-exposure suits, which is a complete rubberized um, outfit, one piece, you had to get into with a neck that was tight, you know, a rubber neck around here, rubber wrists, uh, thermal boots. The whole reason for that Mark IV survival is if we ever ditched out in the open ocean, uh, if the ocean temperature was below 60 degrees, you only had a half hour to live in water before you go into uh, your nervous system would back up on you. You couldn't swim. You couldn't even lift your hand in a coordinated fashion. And you'd drown. If you were just in the life vest, your whole body basically would be trying to heat up the ocean, the whole ocean, to match your body temperature, 98.7, mm -hmm. so you rapidly would lose heat. The anti-exposure suit gave you maybe another 45 minutes uh, to survive. And hopefully something could happen to by then you can get into the life raft and mm -hmm. <clears throat> let your body heat warm up, warm up the suit. So on these long patrols that we fly out over the North Atlantic. How, how long would a patrol be approximately? Well, they vary from 10 hours to 14 hours. Um, uh, the one, the one, one deployment we had was out of Iceland. And uh, it was cold there. We flew a, a VPSSK barrier, it's called, between Iceland and Greenland, and between Iceland and the Faroe Islands. And then the British had from the Faroe Islands over to Norway. This was during the Lebanon crisis of 58. We thought the, uh, the Russians were going to get involved and they were going to send their fleet down to the Med, so they would come through what's called the Icelandic Gap. That way we could, if we patrol there, we could alert our forces that the Russians are coming, uh, and so are their submarines. So we had a, a coordinated um, strategy between my area, which is called VP. By the way, VP stands for heavier V, heavier than air patrol. A VF squadron is a heavier than air fighter squadron. VA heavier than air, attack squadron. You have others, uh, L, uh, start with L, lighter than air. Th their squadrons would start with an L, the old blimps, you saw them? Okay. 
Everything's got its designator. But a VP SSK barrier, very interesting. We would be out here flying a, a big 200 mile pattern around in the, this designated area. We, we could do random, but we had to cover the whole area with our radar blasting away, which is quite different from our normal strategy. Normally we, we use passive electronic warfare, which was listening. But this, we were up there blasting our... The idea was that the Russians were sending down their, their uh, diesel submarines with snorkel. They'd, they'd, hear, they'd see our radar on their electronic countermeasures equipment. They would see that we're out there looking for them, so they would submerge. And then they would transit maybe 150 miles, but then their batteries would start running low. So they stick up the snorkel to get some air and to recharge their batteries. In the meantime, if they did that, or even if they were just a diesel, we had submarines located strategically along our, our barrier, and they were down at depth listening below the, the, uh, the sonic barrier level. Temperature gradient uh, creates a barrier that you can't hear sound, but the channels of sound, they get down there at the depth that a sub would normally be at. Or, and would listen, if they heard something suspicious, they had a, a, a floating antenna up at the surface, mm -hmm. they could call us in. They would call us in, we'd rendezvous with them, and they'd shoot us out the course of this disturbance that they heard. So we would go out and investigate to see what it was. We caught many, many Russian trawlers this way. <laughs> The trawlers had the same engine as the submarines had, <laughs> same diesel engine, so they sounded just like a sub. Uh, but that was the strategy during the Lebanon crisis. Uh, this is all Cold War. Not many people know about this stuff. Um, the British were doing the same thing on, between the Pharaohs and Norway. Um, Did you have many encounters with Soviet submarines that you know Actually, no. Way? I never. I never mm -hmm. caught a Russian submarine, mm -hmm. Cold War. Uh, they, kept, they kept themselves pretty close to home most of the time. Um, the one sub I did catch was on patrol during the Lebanon crisis. Uh, we were just coming off station. <coughs> the other aircraft had relieved us after our 12-hour mm -hmm. patrol. We were heading back to Keflavik, Iceland. When my aft station called out, sir, I see periscopes. So I hit the button and set the, the data boy down and started prosecuting and I could hear it. Because uh, we could hear, everybody in the plane could hear the sounds that were, the, the sound of boy drops in and it drops a little microphone down, mm -hmm. down to 300 feet. And it listens. It's 360 degree listening. Um, and if it picks it up, it will transmit the signal to you, and you can hear it. This thing sounded like a couple of empty garbage cans banging together. Um, quite different from most other, any other sub sound, but it was definitely man-made, big banging sound. Um, by the time I got my pattern set in the water, we, we set a north, uh, east, south, and west buoy, and we would circle that pattern at the 300, 200 feet, and we had mad gear aboard that could pick up the magnetic anomaly of a big, huge piece of metal like a submarine. It could disrupt the normal magnetic pattern over the surface of the Earth. Um, we'd fly through it, and we'd get an indication on our equipment, call out Madman, another smoke, designate that spot, go up to 350 feet, open the bomb bays, and come back out with your bomb bays open. If you got another Madman, then you could drop a torpedo ahead of it. And uh, the torpedo would search out the sub and kill it. That was the strategy. Uh, before I could get my north, I got my north boy. I got my data boy and my north boy laid. Before I could get the east boy laid, the sound started fading. And by the time I got to my south boy, the sound was gone. But we got it on recording. 
There was something there. And came back, sent in a contact report to Home Plate. When we got, when we got back to Keflavik, um, there was a couple of um, limousines there with flags on them. Never knew anybody was like that was on the base. And they hauled us off to a briefing room. And there were uh, like three Navy captains there. And uh, they started asking us, what did you hear? What did you see? And we told them what we had heard and saw. And uh, they wanted to know if the periscope was round, or was it uh, uh, you know, oblong, or was it uh, square? Uh, what, what, did that, what did the periscope window look like? Well, the guy in the back who saw it went there and he went, well, here's the water, sir. And you do two sticks sticking up. He said, that's what I saw. <laughs> that was it. And they said, OK, thank you very much. And they dismissed us. Uh, it was two months later where the news broke that the Nautilus had made its uh, under north, the North Pole circuit. Or if they announced it immediately, um, they didn't say what the route was or anything. But Time Magazine had that date, that time, with a big star on it, located where the, and that was right there, uh, off, just off the southwest coast of Iceland, at the time I had my contact. So I always claim I caught the Nautilus. <laughs> uh, okay. It so, was, how long were you, you were in the service uh, until 59, regular? Active duty till active 59. Duty. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and was that spent with this unit? Yes, all that time? That, those two years from 57, mm -hmm. October 57 to October 59, was all with BP-23. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time I was out, I was a patrol plane commander, uh, and I was released to the reserves at my request. Uh, my commanding officer tried to talk me into staying active duty. Uh, we had our first daughter by then, and my wife and I conferred. And uh, it was a touchy decision. We weren't too sure, because I was enjoying my active duty. Mm -hmm. Wonderful people, just wonderful. And the, the camaraderie and, and spirit in the squadron can't be beat. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. um, but we decided not to. My wife wasn't too keen on my flying, and uh, I don't know, that worked on me a little bit. And anyway, we decided we'd try civilian life. So I came out, and uh, but I joined the reserves within two months after getting off active duty and started drilling down at Willow Grove, Pennsylvania. Was that an aviation unit? Yes. So uh, my first squad was VP-932. Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, as a reservist. The program manager was a lieutenant, and his name was Skinny Millard, a real character, nice guy. They were all nice guys. Mm -hmm. So for, uh, I flew for 10 years after I got off active duty down at Willow Grove, qualified as a patrol plane commander, like within six months after getting into the reserves. Were you Again, flying the same? It? Same aircraft? Different aircraft. Uh, we were flying the P2V-5F. Active duty was the P2V-7. Mm -hmm. Reserves were flying P2V-5F. It was a P2V-5, the first version that had the jets outboard. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Well, no, when I first got in the reserves, we were flying P2V-3s and 4s. Two engines. Not as well equipped as the P2V-7. That's right. I forgot that. But I qualified as peripheral plane commander in the P2V-3 with the two engines. Mm -hmm. And then the P2V-5F came in. They were being released from active duty squadrons given to the reserves to maintain. And the P2V-5F had the jets. Flew those for um, about five years. And then they started returning P2V-7s to the reserves. We always got the leftovers from active duty. <laughs> the whole idea was, okay, we're one happy Navy family, active and reserved. Um, 
The only difference was, and we all sit down at the same table, the only difference was the food would be served first to the active duty side. And by the time it got around to the reserve side, there might not be much on the plate. That's not a bad or nor too inaccurate uh, way of looking at it. So the reserves were a little tight on money usually, but you know, the reserves served a real strong message. On my drill weekends, we go out and fly the patrols to relieve the active duty guys. Fly the same patrols I flew out of BP-23 Brunswick, except we fly out of, out of uh, uh, Willow Grove, which is near Philadelphia, and uh, fly, cover an area of the ocean. I remember when I was on active duty with BP-23 out in Brunswick, a reserve group came in for their two weeks active duty, and it was right during the time when we were having a, a, an exercise off the Atlantic seaboard, and um, five submarines were caught during that exercise, okay? All five were caught by the reserve crews, not the active duty guys. Yeah. The reserve crews flying older aircraft and so forth. We tried to figure out why. Well, the reason was these guys had flown for years together as a team. And they, they knew one another's frailties and strengths and they could play off that and they really know how to work together as a team. Where our active duty forces, even though we all try to standardize the full operation, every day you go out flying and you'd have different members of your crew. And we flop, switch off crews and, uh, on a regular basis. And you get new guys coming in, they had to be trained because uh, they didn't know that much coming on active duty. And you're working with a 12-man crew. That includes yourself. So you get maybe three officers and nine enlisted men on the plane, and you're flying with a different crew on different flights. And uh, they, they actually, the active duty guys weren't this well. We thought we were sharp. We really knew what we were doing. But the uh, reserves absolutely amazed us. So anyway, <clears throat> so I flew with the reserves for 10 years. It's now 1969, and uh, I got promoted to commander. That's an 05, and uh, what happened there was sort of a kiss on the cheek and a boot in the fanny at the same time. Congratulations, you're promoted. You're now non-pay and off-flight status. You're now going to go into the uh, wing staff. Non pay as reserve. By now, I had had about uh, oh, around eight, 17 years, uh, 69. Let's see, I went in in 55 to 69. So that's 14 years. 14 years when I made commander. And uh, just couldn't understand why they would do that to you. When, as you know, for officers, you've got this large base of beginning officers that come in. It's like a pyramid. Here's your ensigns, and there's fewer slots available for JG, then for lieutenant, then for lieutenant commander, then for commander, then for captain, then admiral. Not many jobs left by the time you get there. Mm -hmm. But I continued drilling and uh, for about a year, non-pay. Then they opened up a, uh, a, a, a an annex group up at Niagara Falls. The Navy thought they would show a presence in Western New York again. And they opened up uh, NAS 3803. And uh, that was a naval air, naval air station, other reserve unit. We had no aircraft, and it was really just sort of a holding pool of reserve personnel. Uh, I eventually, I, I was picked up there as training officer, and then became executive officer, and then became commanding officer. Um, that was for, <clears throat> what, 69, 70? I started there like in 1970. Uh, in 75, I made captain, that's an 06, mm -hmm. with the reserves. 
and uh, as commanding officer of 30, NES 3803. Then I went a couple more years, um, well, another year in pay status uh, in, a, in a, a reserve BT, heavier than air training position as CO up there. Still had no aircraft, couldn't afford it. But on two weeks active duty, we would go to either Willow Grove and fill in, do things on base. Or once we went to Meridian, where there was jet training, carrier quals, I had a chance to fly carrier qual again, uh, flight, but I did horribly because it was single engine, it was jet, which I <laughs> hadn't flown naval aircraft in a bunch of years. And eventually, they decided to close down the annex groups and uh, cut down, and then I served another oh, year, year and a half, non-pay, and then I decided, well, I've done 24 years, active, uh, active and reserve combined. It's time to hang up my hat. So I did. I retired, oh, like November of 1979. And, uh, <coughs> that ended my and joined then into the standby reserve until I reached age 60. And now I'm in the retired reserve. Once you get a commission, it's for life. Mm -hmm. And I'm still trying to serve my country a little bit by uh, the activities locally. I was became president of the Western New York Naval Reserve Association. I was elected to that. And, uh, I served as I, I served as president of the third district for the Naval Reserve Association. That included all of New York State, Northern New Jersey, and Connecticut. Um, and I've stepped back from that, but now I'm with the uh, Armed Forces Week committee. And this year, the Navy is responsible for Armed Forces Week. That's why I'm in uniform. <clears throat> how, how do you think your time in the Navy has had an effect on your life? Oh boy, big time. Like when we first got married. Uh, on my married life, did you say? Or my your, life? <laughs> your whole life. On my whole life. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I mean, Ever since getting into the military, uh, I've had the fortune of um, having a relationship and an association with, with some of the finest people I've ever met. And uh, I've gotten a lot of ways of looking at life through the military. Because you get such a mix of people. It's, it's just wonderful. Um, I've met some of the finest teachers I've ever seen in my life in the military. Guys who really know their stuff and know how to put it across. And you're dealing in life and death issues frequently with, with the uh, instruction that you get. Your life's on the line every time you go fly and, and so the instruction has to be good. You gotta know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so many of them served as models for me when I later went into the field of teaching. I take a look at how well organized they were. And, uh, them and the whole educational movement of um, education through specific behavioral objectives came back into play. You probably remember that. Oh, yes. Uh, it, felt, it just felt natural to be able to get into using that format. And, uh, that impacted on my professional career that kind of background and knowledge and a way of looking at issues and dealing with it. And you know, the Navy's a very, well, the military, it's a people business. I mean, you've got so many, and there's issues, human issues, every day. You're going into the job, there's always some issue, and it's gotta be worked through people. Mm -hmm. I ended up becoming a, a counselor. First a teacher, then a school counselor. Because I was counseling as an officer anyways. Guys in my unit, uh, my division, you know, there was, there was issues and problems. And you sit down and you got to talk with them and try to figure out the best way to proceed. 
and uh, it did influence my teaching, it influenced my becoming a school counselor. Uh, I know some people say that's, you know, you have to be schizophrenic to be able to live in both of those realms, but I found them to be very compatible. As a commanding officer of a unit, uh, I drew heavily upon my training as a school counselor to help me work through issues with, with uh, a lot of issues that would come up. Um, so, yeah, it in, they both infected one another. My careers in education affected my military, and my military affected my educational career. Okay, if you just hold these photographs like this, Wayne will focus on them. If you could tell us where and when each okay. of these was taken. I call this um, a serious ensign. This is me as an ensign shortly after my commission. I was trying to look really serious here. And unfortunately, I think I succeeded so much I actually look angry. <laughs> but that was me as an ensign. Okay. Uh, this is me when I was commanding officer of uh, NAS 3803. We're just starting our two weeks active duty, and I had my whole unit with me. That was about 300 men and about uh, 40 officers. And uh, we were down to Willow Grove for two weeks active duty. The gentleman I'm presenting that little gift to is uh, Captain Brian Smith, who at one time was program manager for me also. So he knew my frailties as a pilot. Gave, gave me a chewing out a couple of times in the past, but we got along well. Um, what I'm giving him there is a tie tack, which shows a buffalo in it. So this is from the buffalo unit. Was, he was at that time commanding officer of Naval Air Station, Willow Grove, Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, this is me with my wife. Um, we're at the military ball, Armed Forces Week, military ball, uh, several years back. That's my wife, Camille. And uh, we had two, two daughters who now have given us six grandchildren. Oh, by the way, my oldest grandchild, Catherine Monty. Now down at Corpus Christi, <laughs> learning to be a naval aviator. Mm -hmm. She graduated from the University of Rochester, and she's an ensign. Hmm. <clears throat> That's me as when I was commanding officer, an AS-3803. I was just promoted to captain here. Uh, I, I did wear a mustache for a while. <laughs> I eventually got rid of it, went back to my normal look. Mm. Okay. okay, well, thank you very much. Now, can we keep those photographs?